Thank you to everyone who's joined us today and to each of our panelists this morning. And thank you to Adam Sennett and the Society of Professional Journalists Northeast for making this forum possible. The International Network of Street Papers, or the INSP, celebrates its 27th anniversary this month and offers technical support, content sharing, and network opportunities to more than 100 street papers across 35 countries. While INSP papers vary in their frequency, focus, and styles, all of us provide immediate income opportunities to homeless or socially marginalized vendors and offer the community support that allows our vendors to feel seen, heard, and valued as people who matter. My name's Tim Harris. I'm a member of the INSP board and I've worked at a variety of street papers over the last 30 some years. I'm joined today by an international panel of street paper leaders from Sweden, Greece, Mexico, and the United States, and by the editor of the INSP's street news service based in Glasgow. We are here today to discuss the strengths and challenges of our movement and to assess the continued relevance of street papers in a troubled world. If any of our viewers have a question, you can type that into chat and we'll do what we can to see that that is answered. Let's meet our panelists. How about each of you, starting with Kaya, tell us who you are and where you're from and one surprising thing about your paper. Good morning, everyone, and thank you, Tim, for gathering us. I'm Kaya Sand, and I'm the executive director of Street Roots. We're based in Portland, Oregon, in the Old Town neighborhood, and we've been around for 22 years. I uh, One of the, I guess, uh, exciting things to, to try to impart is actually just the feel of what's going on behind me today. It's our new paper day. And so this is a bundle of 200 of our papers and the truck shows up every week and our vendors, people experiencing homelessness and poverty, unload that truck. And a number of folks with their walkers and wheelchairs cart these bundles in. Everyone just uses what they have in order to participate. Thank you for that. Esteban? Thanks, Tim. Thanks, Kaya. Uh, hello to everybody. And, and thanks to the Society of Professional Journalists um, for hosting this event. and. For Tim, thank you for organizing and, and moderating today. Likewise, the fellow panelists, it's an honor to share the virtual stage with you today. Um, my name is Esteban Alvarez. I am from Mexico City, uh, and I am the director of Mi Valedor. Uh, Mi Valedor is a bi-monthly cultural uh, publication that is focused heavily on street photography, graphic design, contemporary art, um, and I've been at the helm of Muralidor for almost a year. Uh, it's probably a good moment, uh, seeing as I am with experienced editors and journalists, to say that my background lies more in the policy civil rights agenda, and uh, but I still have obviously immense respect for all the work that journalists like yourself do every day and, and across the globe and, and work with a team of editors and, and journalists here in Mexico. Um, I think one aspect of working at Mi Valedor is, that has surprised me uh, as I've kind of come to know the project a bit more and, and really immersed myself in the world of street papers is uh, how visibly it responds to both structural challenges, say extreme poverty, homelessness, uh, inadequate social housing, uh, a lack of public services, uh, at the same time responding to immediate crisis, such as the pandemic or migration here in Mexico, which are two things that have been uh, very present. Um, and so I think it, sadly, maybe, and, and it, it only takes a few days or weeks for people that are facing extreme adversity to show up at our doorstep. And so as Kai was saying, uh, we offer a, basically a solution or an opportunity to try and uh, give them an opportunity to make a, a bit more of an income and, and, and also gain additional services. So. Uh, would love to discuss that with, with you all, and, and thanks again for the, for the invitation. Thank you. Tony, how you doing over there? All right. Um, yeah, thanks, Tim, and to the Society of Professional Journalists for gathering us all together. Um, it's really cool to see um, some familiar faces. Um, we would have probably 
spoken and seen each other a lot more over the last couple of years were it not for you know everything that's going on so it's nice to be in this sort of situation uh talking about uh what we all know and love which is street papers um my name's tony ingles i'm the editor of the international network of street papers the charity organization that supports street papers throughout the world as tim said at the start of the call um, I'm based in Glasgow. I'm from Glasgow. Um, we're sharing office space with uh, one of the UK street papers, The Big Issue. And um, I've just been back in the office for about um, a week, two weeks uh, now, which is uh, really cool to be around um, street papers being made and vendors coming and going and, and buying and selling street papers again. Um, I can't obviously say anything surprising about my street paper because I'm not speaking for one in particular. Um, I'm probably going to repeat that a uh, number of times on the call but um i just would like to say that um i'm content i'm continually surprised by the the rich diversity and the amazing work that street papers across the network do um, and continue to do and have been doing this past uh, 18 months especially and um, so i'm excited to hear about all your different perspectives uh, firsthand today fantastic sarah Hi, everybody. It's nice to see you. And thank you, Tim, for organizing this and also being invited to this great event tonight. Uh, my name is Sarah. I'm uh, editor-in-chief for uh, the second largest, uh, the largest, uh, largest uh, street paper in Sweden. There are two of us. One is situated in Stockholm and we are in Gothenburg, where we have our headquarters since 20 years. Uh, we have also uh, offices in three other smaller cities in the West Coast in Sweden. I've been in the journalist business for almost 30 years and uh, been working with Factum for the last six years, today actually. So it's kind of adverse ad for me. Uh, I think one surprising thing for Swedish in the Swedish context, it's strange that a uh, um, street paper is needed in such a wealthy and uh, rich country as Sweden. But half of our vendors are coming from there are poor migrants and refugees coming from other EU cities, yeah, other EU EU um, countries as Bulgaria and Romania. So we have worked a lot with races on the street. It's also strange and situation in Sweden because this is kind of shameful sell, selling things on the street. So we are uh, struggling with those things that we are in, under the pandem pandemic as well as other uh, papers. The gap between rich and poor are growing in Sweden. And I think Factum and the street paper movement uh, has a challenge here to, to organize poor people to get to empower them and get them uh, a place in the society and give them a voice not only as a source of income, I think it's also very important to, to as a paper to highlight and adv advocate this question where poor people have uh, human rights to take part in the society, even if a wealthy society is Sweden where these questions are not so political hot stuff, if I say so. Thank you for that, Chris. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for this uh, invitation. It's so fantastic to see you all and be part of this. Uh, I'm Chris, uh, based in Athens, uh, Greece, actually. Uh, smack bang in the center of the city, just a stone throw away from the Acropolis. It's been raining ashes for the past couple of days due to the wildfires not too far away from here. Uh, as far as uh, the surprising uh, part of the question. I'm not, I'm not sure that many, too many things surprise us uh, nowadays. I would say as far as we are concerned that uh, many people find surprising that uh, Schedia, which launched back in 2013, I used to say in the middle of the kind of socio-economic crisis, but I've stopped saying this because no one knows when this middle is anymore. It could be you know, uh, up ahead. So I think what many people find surprising is that uh, uh, Sevilla is the largest uh, selling monthly magazine in, in Greece and, uh, and we do dearly enjoy that not only that, not only people buy the magazine, but people read it as well, which is, which is a thing uh, uh, which we love and enjoy very, very much, as, as you understand. <laughs> Thanks for that, Chris. So here's a question for all of you, and we will start with Esteban this time. 
what difference can journalism make in the lives of people who struggle to survive? And what are some of the things that drive the choices about what your paper covers? Yeah, so um, I think that question is framed in, in two ways. One, one is about journalism, and one is about choices. Uh, and I think to, to talk about journalism, I'll, I think we are, I would caveat the question by saying, I think we're all struggling to survive in, in one way or another. And there are, of course, huge differences in circumstances and privilege and inequality. But I think it's important to always try and have an, 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 like an empathy view or an, an empathic way of saying, oh, uh, we are all human, we can all relate uh, around this. And so um, I think on that side, it, journalism to me is, is very simply described as telling the truth or the events in, in a truthful manner uh, that is informative and, and understandable. And if you can achieve this, then you can make a difference. And for us, it might be the difference, for example, in, in reducing vaccine hesitancy amongst our vendors, you know, probably the population that we, we work with and, and really working with them hand in hand to try and get uh, verifiable information that we can publish on the magazine and that we can communicate to them. Um, with regards to choices and how we decide what goes in the magazine or the website, I think we ask three questions. And it, those questions are, are the vendors involved or affected by this issue that we are covering? If so, how? Um, does this piece resonate with broader social justice causes? And uh, thirdly, and, and I guess more to do with uh, how the magazine is structured or, or the focus that we give it with regards to content is what artistic or cultural expression are transgressing or setting uncomfortable dis discussions that are not being currently uh, addressed. And so how can we include those? How can we um, really bring those issues to light? And I think that's one of the unique um, propositions that street papers, or at least here in Mexico and New Alessandro, that we have that flexibility to, to, to really ask ourselves, what are vulnerable populations going through? What are these issues? Why are they not being politicized more? And why are they not being into it, taken into account? All of this in a context that is basically saying, hey, everybody is on the same boat, this huge survival boat, but at the same time, huge inequalities persist. And so really, I would say it's about uh, finding that balance and and obviously understanding that journalism can make a difference, but it requires a lot more other factors to come in, public access to public services, public policy, uh, and all of these conditions which we know. So I think it's, it's really trying to understand where the margins lie for each particular street paper and where the margins lie for each of the particular vendors that you're working with and the broader society in which you're, which you're operating. Fantastic. Uh, Tony? Want to weigh in here? Yeah. Um, so obviously I'm coming at this from a global perspective. And um, I think in short answer to the question is, of course, journalism 100% makes a difference to people who are, who are struggling to survive. Um, I think in my role at INSP, which I don't think I explained very well in the intro, is facilitating editorial sharing and uh, cooperation between the street papers in the network and especially over the last 18 months the thing that I have noticed the most is this um this phenomenon that I guess we're all experiencing that we're all um um being uh, attacked by all these issues and problems that the world is dealing with and um people on the street and marginalized and vulnerable people are are affected by those things doubly triply a hundred times uh, over and so how that manifests itself in street papers is this willingness to um cover um the major issues affecting humanity because ultimately you know it's intersectional um people on the streets are affected by these things the most and whether that be climate change or um, women's rights or racial justice or the rise of the far right. Um, and um, when, with regards to how street papers share those stories, I think um, it's being able to create a link between street papers in different parts of the world and saying, um, look, this is happening here and it's also happening there to the same groups of people and um, creating a sort of like uh, 
uh, solidarity in doing that. And then the other, on the other hand, the thing that street papers do with their journalism to, to show that this is true is the personal stories that they're telling of vendors. And I'm sure like that's um, something that a lot of others, uh, the editors and, and directors and stuff that are talking with us today are gonna talk about. Thank you so much. Uh, Sarah, you're next, but I've got a question here. And I'm hoping that you can just quickly field it in the course of your answer. And that is, how do street papers work? Wow, <laughs> it's a good question. Yeah, uh, just kind yeah. of the basics. <laughs> the kind of basics, yeah. yeah the vendor buys the paper from, from the organization or um, and then they sell it on the street for, for I think, the, most of the paper in the network is uh, they buy it for half the price they sell it on the street for. So they they keep the change, they keep the in between money and in the pocket. And they uh, for us in, in factum they decide how many papers they buy every day or for a week, and they they plan their work time for themselves. And we don't we don't care how much they work or less. They they decide. They take responsibility for their work time and also for the money. So want to fill right. in. Yeah. I, th I think a big part of it is that independence and yeah. that very low threshold work opportunity where somebody can walk into a street paper and an hour or two later be out on the street with a badge and able to start work, right? Yeah. It's a very yeah, it's very easy to to become a street to self to be a vendor. And uh, it's also very included. I think I think it goes for the whole network as well. Uh, we do uh, emphasize that everyone has to must have the opportunity to be self-employed as a vendor, right? And to do their work and plan their work and take responsibility. And I I much agree what Esteban says about the the the, the journalism. What is our not only opportunity, but our responsibility to when it comes to journalism as well, to see, uh, and, and I was, always think of the vendors as our best and most important uh, uh, sources when it comes to deciding what the content in, in, the, in the paper are, because we have to take their questions and make good and, and, and quality and also investigative journalists about it. So, because nobody else will do that. Because when it comes to other other media, they see uh, often. I think I react often of, often of how they portray vendors or people who, who are poor or live in exclusion or homeless. They're also a victim perspective. And for me, it's so, it's so important to lift these people up and tell their stories and and make them a, a body, <laughs> a, a, a people who are who are some, just as equal as I am. We are seeing what each other in, what you say, in the eyes, in the same height. It's not uh, seeing the vendors as uh, some lower person in the society, which I think most media, at, at least in Sweden, do. They, yeah. they need to have a victim and then lift up this person and they have to symbolize something in equality, but they don't listen to their stories. So I think this is very important things for, for street paper move to lift up the stores and with lifting up the stores, we can make change, not only for the person, but also the knowledge of how the society works. If we talk about some system, uh, we talk a lot about environment questions and sustainability, but the social system sustainability is so important to lift up in the future. Fantastic. Thank you for that. Chris? Actually, I think as far as we are concerned, and I think, I guess with most of us, but I will, I will speak from our perspective, it is absolutely clear that if it was not for the vendor, we would never publish a street paper. Mm. So the, really, Schedia is about the vendor first and not the journalist, if I may say it. You know, the journalist is there to, to serve the social call. And how does it do this? By providing, you know, a good journalism. And as far as the content is concerned, you know, we, we do we do care a lot uh, in this part of the world to to adhere to the principles of a uh, solution journalism. You know, people I think in this part of the world, especially, are fed up to 
to to to hear and talk about the problems all the time. So mm -hmm. as as the, as the big issue says, you know that you know part of the solution they mean it in a social way. You know that you know by that it empowers and energizes and uh, it makes the invisible visible again. We try to be part of the solution. Uh, mm -hmm. editorially as well, you know, to talk yeah. about solutions. And I think we we all need this uh, more or less, you know, especially, as I said, in this part of the world, which has been suffering for decades from socioeconomic crisis. Thank you, Chris. So this is a Society of Professional Journalists panel. And uh, let's, let's talk about journalism for a minute. Let's talk about advocacy journalism in particular. Is there a conflict between having an advocacy mission and holding high journalistic standards? And what are some of the unique challenges uh, editorially that your street paper faces? And let's start with you this time, Tony. Uh, yeah, I think this is a really interesting subject um, because um, as someone who has worked in journalism for four or five years now, um, and been working in mainstream media previously to with street papers, um, it really does strike me every day at the professionalism and the thoroughness and the, um, the talent that is throughout the street paper network. Um, sometimes, you know, quite low resourced newsrooms within the street paper network are doing far more thorough journalistic jobs than um, you know, some newspapers in the mainstream media that I know of and who I have friends working in. Um, so I don't think that there is a conflict between being able to uphold high journalistic standards and being able to uh, try and make a difference with your journalism. Um, and uh, I, I mean, like, I have my eye on the whole network and uh, I see, you know, incredible stories uh, coming in to be shared on our newswire every day, and um, it's like really heartening and inspiring um, in that sense. However, where I do think there is a push and pull is the um, incorporation of um, vendors uh, who are unprofessional or, or aren't professional journalists and maybe don't have um, journalism experience or training. Um, being able to allow them to tell their stories directly in the street papers um, means perhaps sometimes not necessarily uh, publishing the most perfect writing, the most um, uh, perfectly sub-edited uh, articles, but instead giving you that like direct experience. I think that that's not hitting high journalism standards per se, but it's getting to something that is unique within street papers that allows that sort of balance between the journalistic standards we have and the ability to try and change people's minds and, and make them understand the, the issues that vendors are experiencing. Um, but again, I can't speak for how each paper and each of their very like specific locales um, deal with this kind of thing. Thanks for that, Tony. Hey, Kaya, I'm going to jump back to you because I'm realizing that I passed you over on the last question. I'm sorry about that. Um, but can you talk about uh, sort of blend these two questions Absolutely. about the things that drive choices about what your paper covers and unique editorial challenges. Yeah, absolutely, Tim. Um, you know, I'm thinking about the way Sarah was talking about the, the last question in terms of the vendors themselves um, help us see what we should be investigating. And Tim, when you were talking about, you know, this is low barrier employment. And the reason why it's so important that it's low barrier is there are so many barriers, right? So in fact, those two things go hand in hand. When we hit up against barriers with people, then that we know that's something we should be investigating. Um, that, that in a sense is a clue to some kind of systemic change that we should be fighting for. So sometimes it's, you know, it's a lot of toggling. Um, going back to what you're asking about this separation between advocacy and journalism or the ways they overlap, 
Um, when we're oh, one, one of the things that I really see at our paper, because we do a lot of advocacy that's more campaign based that's outside of the paper, and it, the onus is really on us to communicate clearly. So when we're approaching someone, we need to be clear about what hat we're wearing. Is it our journalist who, you know, is covering this for the paper? Am I leading a campaign? Um, so that that to me is, you know, all about sort of what the nuts and bolts of communication. But what just one little illustration, because I find it to be so powerful, these different pieces of our organization and how we can push one forward in any moment, a barrier that we, you know, hit up against is the fact that our folks on the streets are over incarcerated, they're over criminalized. So we know that um, over actually 50% of the arrests in our city are people who are unhoused. So we deal with this, people talk to, talk about it, we deal with the fact they can't get into housing, they can't get another job. That in turn pushed our newspaper to do solutions journalism and um, to investigate non-police first responder systems. That in turn pushed our advocacy portion to start to push on that as a campaign. And we toggle between these and we just really, you know, push ourselves to be clear on, on which part that we're pushing forward, but it makes us more impactful. So you're being a little bit modest there, Kaya, because you didn't mention that you actually broke that story about more than 50% of arrests in Portland being homeless people, right? Well, you know, actually, another paper uh, did the first uh, the, the, the first story on that, but we did break the whole plan. We named the plan, um, and now the city has adopted it, but the fight goes on. Thank you so much. Uh, Sarah, back to you. You're yeah. next. Very interesting to listen to you, Kaya. Uh, we don't, we don't have, I, I, I see our journalism as our advocacy. Advocacy is, um, we can't mix it in Sweden because if we organize a demonstration or some action plan, our journalism would be hard um, question about the independence of our journalism. So it, it wouldn't be possible, but I see it. We, we, we do this investigative reports and we do this um, content and we, then we, when we explore things that are injustice and from the vendor side of seeing it. And, and then we can do, I can do columns, I can do debates, I can do take part in the, in the, in the what would you say, the public conversation about the things and, and talk to politicians and talk, so, but we don't do any action, we can't do that. So I, can, I, I see the, I, I don't see the conflict. Chris, how do, you folks, how do you folks straddle that line, Chris? I think actually I, I would like to, 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 to talk a bit about the second part of the question, about the challenges, the editorial challenges. Mm -hmm. uh, one, of, one of the uh, big challenges that we keep, you know, keep, that, that keep coming up is protecting the vendor. Because, you know, buying, buying a street paper is a, is, a, is a very personal transaction, you know what I mean? Uh, you know the vendor, he stands out there in a red, uh, in a red uh, vest, he has his name tag, whatever. Uh, so, you know, we, we find that sometimes, you, sometimes we would run a story, say, on, on Golden Dawn, you know, the Nazi party, and, and the vendors would be attacked. Mm. So it, it always it always plays on my mind how to protect uh, the vendors, you know, uh, while at the same time, you know, uh, saying the things that we feel uh, should be spoken about. Uh, this this I'm not I'm not sure if uh, the, the, the the other street papers are, are faced with uh, the same challenge because we, we've got quite a few quite a few incidents of uh, of vendors being attacked exactly, you know, because because. Uh, we we push the story say about the the extreme right etc. Thank you for. Thank I mean, you the for that. You know, I just I just want to do it. You know, when you buy sort of a paper from a paper kiosk, you know, you will never attack a paper kiosk. You know, if you disagree with the opinion of a of a newspaper or of a magazine, you know what I mean. But still, you know, the vendors are, are copying all this flag sometimes because because of our editorial uh, line. Thank you for that. Esteban, uh, Mexico is known as one of the more dangerous places in the world to be a journalist. How does that impact what you do? Yeah, it's, it's a big challenge, I would say. And I think journalists across Mexico suffer uh, extreme pressure from organized crime, from 
uh, government and uh, government censorship or even self censorship uh, in this in this in this climate. Um, I really liked what Chris had to said about said about protecting the vendors, and and I think that is also very important. And 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 trying to going to draw in these three ideas. Uh, what you were mentioning about advocacy and editorial, if there is a conflict. I don't think there's a conflict. I think the, the, the reason that we do advocacy, or, or rather, we do advocacy through our journalism, as it was said, uh, exactly. That is the, the reason for, uh, I would say, the majority of the street papers. And if we have evolved and we add uh, vendor programs and, and all the support that we can provide, uh, we go into a more charitable side of things. But then, if we are talking about editorial challenges and about what we publish and how we discuss it, sure. Uh, I guess the magazine here in Mexico, we have a particular editorial line, which maybe we're not covering organized crime. And so we are not as exposed. Uh, but I would say the environment, the, the, the environment in which journalism takes place here in Mexico is quite dense, quite heavy. Uh, and so here, uh, there's, a, there's obviously the intersectionality of, of, of things. You know, vendors being highly marginalized, issues being not politicized enough. And when they are politicized, there's obviously this imminent risk. And so, again, we're toggling, we're balancing on how we can address those things and picking sort of the, the issues that we want to bring to light. And then also, uh, we're letting the, the vendors express their voice, letting them tell their story uh, and in a way that is, is obviously safe. Because uh, I don't know, we 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 had an internal debate even about publishing vendor stories online, and then people on the street going up to them and immediately uh, knowing about their lives and, and saying, "Oh, I know you, and, and I read about you." And it even a vendor came to, back to us and said, "I don't know this person. Please take this down." You know, it was a huge editorial uh, and, and a personal lesson in saying, "My information isn't out there, and I protect and I decide what information I share." You know, why is this different? And how can I, uh, as Sarah was saying, look at this person in the eye and treat them as equal when this, uh, this victimization could be, I could be the one doing it. So we're, all, we're constantly asking ourselves those questions and, and obviously how figuring out the balance on how to carry out uh, ethical journalism that benefits uh, a street paper or a street magazine that people want to buy from people that they know as vendors and that can develop a personal relationship because they are in a process of becoming more active in the labor market or uh, in recovery from uh, an array of problems that we know a lot of vendors suffer from. And so really dealing with all of those issues is, is how we go about it. And, and, and I think the best way of, of, of managing that is, is to find a balance and to have a, a, an editorial team which speaks to the vendor team and which involves them in, in all of the decisions at some form and some level. And so that's where I, we, we struggle and, and, and finding you know, this in, a, in an environment, obviously, that it's sent to, to do and, 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 and dangerous to carry out journalism. Uh, yeah. So. Thank you for that. Let's talk about the pandemic and how that's affected our work. Street papers are by their nature based on face-to-face -face interactions on the street between vendors and their readers. And much of the, I think the transformative power of street papers comes from the community that is born out of that and how that changes perceptions of, of people and uh, and, and how that supports the vendor's esteem and their own sense of themselves as a person. The pandemic has really made that work a lot more difficult. How has that affected your paper and what are some of the adaptations that you have made over the last few years to, to get through this? And let's start with you on this one, Sarah. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we were never in lockdown, so we had our vendors coming buying the papers that are in our office all the time, and we are all we are in the same situation now as we were in uh, March last year. I think uh, they are not allowed in into our office. Uh, we sell it in in this very we have queue system, and we have social distance. And it has affected them. I, see, I can see 
with my own eyes that they are much more deeper in their uh, addictions. I can see they are more lonely. They are suffering more from psychic, psychic depressions and loneliness and all that. Because just coming to the office and take a cup of coffee, we don't have so much social work at Factum, but coming to the office and get a cup of coffee, uh, borrow the computer for time, read the newspaper, meant a lot for them. I think it meant more than we thought it did. Uh, so, um, but we are grateful anyway to keep business going on all the time. Uh, and for hopefully in some couple of months, we can see the end of this and we can let them in at the office again. But uh, we had a big challenge because uh, our economic, uh, our income from Factum is only the sales in the street and ads in the paper. We don't have any fundraising. We don't have a structure for fundraising or we don't have any grants. So uh, economically, it was a big, um, it was a big problem, right? And um, we were just about to launch our Factum short story special edition. And we were thinking a lot about how we could sell it uh, on the internet, digital selling, and in a way that the vendors could benefit of it as they usually do, they have half of their income. So we created a, a, a payments um, uh, structure that the, the, when you bought the, this special edition of Factum, half of the income went to a vendor fund and for this money, we could buy a paper for ourselves from ourselves and give to the vendors. So if they buy one factor from us, they did get, did get two for free from this pay money from, from the special edition. So we transfer the money and we help the vendors through this very, very difficult month. And we also lower the price for the original factums. They could they get it for half the price in January, February so they could get their income was rising. So we had a system going on with this special edition digital payment. So it wasn't much, it, it wasn't so, it wasn't a big success. It wasn't, we could sell so much of it, but, but we could survive this very, very hard month with us transferring money from, from digital payment to the vendors. But it, it was, the pan, I can say the pandemic has been also good for us because it took our brains down to our uh, mission, our basic mission. What is our basic mission? Is to do the best magazine so it could sell on the streets. So we have, I mean, we had had one or two years we have invented much more. We could do event, we can do a pod, we can podcast, we can do that and that. But the pandemic just said, stop, no, go back two steps, start all over again and think what you're doing with your resources. And it has to be in the, the benefit for the vendors. You can't be creative just being, it's fun. Thank you for that. That makes a lot of sense. Chris, what's it look like in Athens? Um, actually, Sarah said that they were never in lockdown. The fact is that uh, uh, we had to be off the streets for about eight months. So Sevilla goes off the streets for eight months since March 2020. I think I've asked Tony before, you know, probably the longest that uh, the street paper has been off the street due to the pandemic. You can, I think most of us, all of us, all of you, you know, can understand the, the devastating effect on the vendors, you know, because, you know, very poor people, you know, through Skidia and our street paper, they had regained a sense of normality, you know, a sense of purpose, you know, waking up in the morning, selling the magazines, and, and all of a sudden, you know, they were asked to hide again, you know, that was, that was really, really devastating. And uh, we, did, we did our best that we could to support them through this uh, period, whether, you know, through our online subscription uh, system, which we built on, you know, and actually what we did is out of each subscription, you know, 50% of the money as, as with a magazine down the street sale, you know, would go straight to the vendor, you know, and, uh, and, and, and other uh, activities of, of this nature, uh, mostly trying to keep them connected because this is what they mostly miss you know this sense of connection with the rest of the world you know just just very quickly my, my favorite sort of a initiative was uh, asking volunteers you know providing telephones to the vendors who didn't have even a, hand, a telephone and asking volunteers to call them you know just to say a calimera hi to them 
that was a that was a grand success. We had hundreds of volunteers, you know, Bob Barnabas with calls every day. I don't think they enjoyed it that much uh, after a certain period of time. But you know, it was about you know trying 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 to 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 make people not to lose hope again. You know, that was, that yeah. was that's what we tried to do. I hope we succeeded that. Thanks for that, Chris. Uh, Kaya, how about street roots? Yeah, I, uh, I'd start off by just saying that being a member of INSP and then our North American Bureau has been a lifeline because we could keep meeting and sharing and swapping ideas. So that's been incredibly important to enduring. Um, we, we ended up, in a sense, having to bolster two different parts of our organization because we had to split our mission. We, you know, for five months stopped printing as a number of papers did in North America and yet we're committed to journalism. So we didn't want to stop producing journalism and we wanted to keep street routes in front of people's eyes when they were at home. So we just pushed our journalism in terms of its digital presence and launch podcasts and did 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 more did more photo packages because it was digital um, at the same time we had to come up with new ways for vendors to earn income and we ended up doing that by really keeping media at the center but looking at the kinds of work that are important in a crisis. Um, so in the pandemic, like the essential work and now looking forward is the rolling crises. But um, so what we, what we did is we created a, what we call an ambassador program, another way to pay vendors. And we built this up from some of our vendors, what they were already doing. They were living on the side of the freeway uh, and they were actually, operating a kind of medevac tent in case people got COVID who were also unhoused. We ended up bringing them onto staff to run a program where our vendors go out and do public health outreach. They we think of it in terms of media as they're like the town criers, it's person to person on the streets. And then we started doing other things uh, that are sort of media related. This, we did surveys and we're continuing to do surveys so that we can do the research because none of the policymakers are getting information directly from the streets. Um, and, you know, we're doing other things related to that, like what's what is the space that we inhabit well, and how do we create work opportunities so I'll just say, because I feel like a year and a half in now, you know the crises keep coming right the Delta variant is swollen up the fires, the heat dome here in the Northwest, we had a really big heat dome. So our vendors are working in those areas. Now they're actually, we're doing a contract with the fire department. So they go out and do fire outreach to camps. So we just kind of realized, well, if these crises keep coming, we have to find the work within the crises. Yeah, I mean, heat dome might not mean some, anything to people outside of, of Portland, but you guys saw 116 degrees recently, is that right? We did. Um, we nearly 100 people in our state died of this heat. It's not a region, and just like where you are, Tim, these aren't regions that are accustomed to this high heat. So, for instance, air conditioning is not common. So um, we are now uh, you know, entering into our new normal of weather disasters from our climate. Thank you for that. Esteban, how's it looking with you folks? Yeah, so I think we did a, a mix and match of some of the ideas that were discussed here. Uh, March of last year, we launched a specific fundraising campaign, which was an emergency support fund for the vendors understanding that we were gonna be in lockdown for at least uh, three or four weeks uh, here in Mexico, as I'm sure in other countries, we have a traffic light system. And so in red, it's lockdown, uh, yellow, we can operate um, with some restrictions and green operate normally. And Mexico has been between yellow and red in uh, the majority of these 15 months. Uh, and so we fundraised specifically for this cause and we were able to provide vendors with emergency support uh, which basically could cover some of their uh, expected income that they were normally obtaining from the magazine sales. Uh, similar to what Kyle was mentioning, we moved quite a lot of our work towards the digital um, 
medium and really used our website uh, and our social media as a platform. Uh, in, and a platform for vendors specifically. And so this was another way of trying to basically generate income for them. Uh, they could still hand in uh, work via email if they had access to a computer, or specifically, we had one person in the office once a week that could receive uh, content from the vendors and really manage that. And then we would be able to publish that on the website and have a little bit of money to pay them and so this is obviously manageable because we're a small street paper. Uh, if we had thousands of vendors, then obviously that would put immense budgetary constraints. But I think the, pan the pandemic visualized, again, like Sarah was mentioning, how you have to go back to basics and see what you can do with the people that you have and how you're going to help the small amount or large amount of, of vendors that you had. Um, and so I guess this digital content, even uh, digital issues of the magazine that we had, uh, focused heavily on how we can connect the vendors there. And uh, I guess one of the key lessons that we've had from this pandemic was something that Chris mentioned, the connections. And so this notion that we were losing touch with our vendors and that we were losing them and they were uh, slowly uh, falling back uh, into maybe not the best of habits or conditions that they had previously surpassed and that we saw them coming into the office. And so... Um, Sometimes, uh, or I guess we, we relied on a pool of volunteers and civil society to basically equip them with telephones or contact details, and we would do same periodic check-ins with them uh, and really use the time uh, that maybe they weren't selling the paper, they couldn't sell the paper to work on other complementary issues. And so our volunteers would donate maybe one hour of their time uh, to check in on the vendor and then also become a support network for, for example, documentation. And so uh, say if some of our uh, vendors didn't have ID, government issued IDs became digital here in Mexico or parts of them. And so how we could link those two things in the pandemic was a volunteer that has the digital capabilities to issue uh, or basically obtain a, 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 an ID for a vendor and connect those two parts. And so now we are basically seeing how we can build up on that. Um, and so those were the two channels, I guess, that we followed. We also launched subscriptions. Obviously, digital subscriptions are uh, a, a whole topic in and of itself because uh, the, the basically the street paper model relies on having the vendor sell you a physical right. copy. Um, but this was also sort of seen as a, as a way of supporting the project more generally, the cause. And so people really were on board with that. And the same, 50% of, of subscriptions go to, go to donors, sorry, go to, go to vendors and 50% and go to the organization to cover the cost. Thanks for that, Esteban. Uh, Tony, what would you like to add to this? Um, I would just say that, uh, you know, a big part of what street papers do is, is um, reduce stigma between members of the public and people on the streets and marginalized communities. And in this world where um, social distancing is the norm and masks, uh, if you're a person who hangs on to those harmful stereotypes and that stigma, um, those kinds of things make approaching a person on the street in a mask, unable to see their like smiling face so much more difficult. Um, but as you've heard from everyone else on the call, um, the pandemic really has uh, accelerated street papers um, ability to be uh, um, uh, flexible. And uh, from an INSP perspective also, um, I would say, you, Tim, you, sort of, you said street papers are communities where they are. Well, the existence of INSP shows that street paper network, street papers all over the world are a community together. And yeah. the pandemic obviously affected our um, abilities to um, get together and share ideas and share inspiration. And there's a lot of like really natural um, uh, things that are, are passed from street paper staff to the other uh, in those situations that we've lost. But as Kaya said, um, INSP has been working to ensure that that hasn't got lost through you know Zoom calls and resources being made available and our newswire continuing to work at the frequency it always did. Um, so I guess like the pandemic has been a good thing in some ways as well as being this bad thing that's happened to us all as well. That's great, thank you. We have about 10 minutes left to this panel and we got a couple of questions left. So I'm gonna ask you all to 
be unusually brief in your answers to the next couple of questions. Um, one of the things that street papers do that uh, is invisible to a lot of people because it's more internal is support our vendors in ways that go beyond selling the paper. Tell us about some of the other vendor engagement strategies that your papers have, things that you're involved in, starting with you, Chris. It, it is what we said, you know, and, and we keep saying to people that uh, Schedia is not just about selling the street paper. You know, it's much more than this. I mean, we, we all know and we know that, you know, people who come through our door and they are devastated lives, they have lost uh, everything. And in that everything, we include the belief in themselves and belief in society and the whole being itself. So what we, what we do try to do is... is uh, provide access to people to the simple joys of life that will make them believe again in themselves and in the rest of the world. It could be, you know, a choir, yoga classes, or connection with the, uh, with the employment, uh, of course, uh, market, or a petang team, a soccer team, or if I can uh, stay there at home, you know, training people to be cooks. I'm in our restaurant right now, uh, and one of my uh, favorite projects, if I may say, this is our upcycling project. You know how we, I think we can see the lampshade on, on my back here. You know, this is made out of uh, unsold copies of Shedia. So we, we've trained uh, the homeless people to transform what's trash to most people, you know, an old magazine into beautiful items. So then and they have a salary now, you know, they're, they're fully full time employed by us. They make them, we sell them. And that's how they get paid. So it's it's about again. I come I come back to connecting people and making them believe in themselves and in the rest of the world. Thank you. I hope I was swift. Beautifully put, uh, Kaya. How about you? I I love those examples Chris gave. That sounds like a lot of fun. Um, we you know we definitely emphasize community here and that can be in a really basic way like you just have a place to get your morning cup of coffee and say hello to someone and those rituals are so important we have one vendor who works as a vendor liaison now um, who connects vendors to different ways to barter so there's someone out there right now serving coffee to people there's someone you know handing out supplies and I would say, you know, with that kind of piece of community is that vendors end up telling us things that maybe I might tell my brother, you know, like I finally got that appointment that I've been trying to get, right? Like those little pieces that we just need someone to hear. But I'd say kind of going on the more dramatic scale, um, we also really deal with life and death here. And so... We hosted a wedding in the pandemic. We host memorials and funerals. One of our vendors made a memorial wall in our office. We do a death report every year for our county of how many people die on the streets and we document it. So um, there's a way in which I think we're connected to the, the, the very extreme and powerful moments in people's lives. Excellent. Uh, Esteban. Yeah, so I was mentioning before about, uh, I guess, these connections, and that's really replicating uh, in our vendor program. Uh, vendors come in, they can grab a cup of coffee, uh, they can discuss and be in a safe environment. We also try and organize things that are uh, fun and entertaining and dignifying, going to a museum, going to a theater, uh, doing a yoga class. All of these, all of these actions are important in, in our lives because they are uh, fundamental human rights to do what you like. And so um, we really try and take that approach and, and really trying to get to know our vendors and they decide and propose and be uh, the motors of what we should be doing as, as an institution. Obviously, we have a, a support network if you want to get your documentation or if you want to have an appointment or if you want specific things, but it's more about what they want and how we can help them as an organization to get there. Uh, you know, tree planting can be one of these activities and, and cooking and, and so on. Um, we're not just yet, we haven't figured out yet how to make a value proposition, uh, like Chris was saying, you know, as in something they can build and, or make and sell and, and it be sustainable economically. 
but I think that's what lies ahead. That's one of our challenges. You know, how can we make this more of a, of a wholesale or a bit rather integral solution? Fantastic. Uh, Tony. Yeah, I just want to fly the flag for some of the other projects within the Street Paper Network that aren't represented on the call. So um, in Australia, the Big Ish Australia has a subscription service that is all run by marginalized women. Um, in Oklahoma City, the Curbside Chronicle has a flower shop where um, vendors learn to, you know, put together uh, bouquets of flowers and sell them for an additional income. Um, in Montreal, the Tenerere has a, a cafe, the Roundhouse Cafe, where uh, in, Indigenous uh, Canadians are employed and, and got into work and given a stable income. And um, as the editor at INSP, I've been able to have the opportunity to actually witness some of these things um, in person. I, the last time I went abroad, I actually went to Athens to see Shadia and the, the upcycling project there and actually speak to the people who work on it and see firsthand the, what they get out of it, so enthusiastic uh, about it. And um, I've been to the Homeless World Cup where I've got to see countless uh, street soccer teams that are connected with street papers perform. Um, so yeah, all these things, they, they may go unseen, but they, they absolutely shouldn't go unnoticed. Thanks so much for bringing that perspective. Uh, Sarah, how about you? Right, yeah. I, I would like to stress what Fakaya said about these small things in their everyday life, to take a cup of coffee, to, to use the computer in the office, to check the news and maybe pay some bills if they need to and can. We have also a cooperation together with the University of Gothenburg with their lawyer students and their, the professor there. They, they do uh, legal advice to the vendors, so not only to vendors, so marginalized people in, in Gothenburg as well. Everybody is welcome to 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 come, and uh, this legal advice is for free, of course. Um, and we started up also uh, uh, invisible tours where the vendors are guided. They guide interested people, and we they get paid for it uh, to see the other side of Gothenburg that isn't yes. seen at the tourists. Uh, offices uh, and the the tour is a mix of their personal history of Gothenburg and also the historical version of Gothenburg as well so I hope we can take this up next summer yeah when we finally have a conference again after the last two that we've missed because of the pandemic you're talking about that summer is it, is it yeah. in Gothenburg next summer is it in Sweden <laughs> Honestly. I'm so sorry not. <laughs> Gothenburg, Gothenburg. <laughs> okay, last question. And this is going to be a bit of a lightning round because we only have a few minutes left. There are a lot of challenges facing the street paper movement. We've got the obsolescence of cash. We've got the overall digitization of the news industry when we have a sort of a face-to-face -face model where we need a, a physical product for the vendors to sell. We're living in the age of pandemic. Despite all of that, or maybe because of all of that, uh, let's do a quick go around, starting with Kaya. Are you optimistic or pessimistic about the future of street papers and why? Utterly optimistic. Um, we, because we we work with people who know how to make something out of nothing. So if they can do it, we can do it. Fantastic, Esteban. Yes, I am definitely optimistic. I think we have a, a challenge of generating unique editorial content, uh, doing advocacy and activism, uh, quality journalism, and really try and fine tune a social enterprise model to scale and the magnitude of challenges, poverty, inequality, un unseen and sadly unattended uh, many times by the public sector. Uh, and so really pushing, pushing for that. Thank you. Tony? 100% optimistic. Um, we have a cohort of uh, people and organizations who are extremely fast on their feet and flexible. That's only been shown by the last 18 months. And um, we're still seeing street papers pop up in new places as well. So 100% optimistic. Fantastic, Sarah. Yeah, 100% optimistic. Uh, we work with brave people and we have to be brave as well. And we are brave and we are professional. Uh, and I think my, uh, my key word for everything I do in the paper is social sustainability. 
And if, if we can have this in top of mind all the time, I think we will survive and do the world a better place. Thank you. And Chris, you got the last word here. Okay. See, the, the funny thing is that when people ask me, you know, what's your vision about Shedia, I always say that my vision about Shedia is for Shedia to shut down one day, you know, that there's no need for Shedias anymore. Uh, I don't think this is going to happen anytime soon, and this is not an optimistic uh, sort of a, a comment. But in the meantime, I, I want to believe that we will keep trying, you know, to stand by people and be uh, socially useful in a sustainable way and keep social innovation at the fore, you know, and keep moving on. Thank you so much. Well, thank you everybody for participating in this. And thank you again to everybody who is here today watching this lovely little panel. This, well, this has been recorded and will be posted, uh, I'm guessing on the SPJ site, but also on the INSP site. So folks who have missed it will be able to see it. It's always great to see you all. It's been way too long and looking forward to next summer in Gothenburg. <laughs> Milan. It's going to be Milan. <laughs> <laughs> Milan will be cool too. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Take care. Lovely to Bye -bye. see you all. Bye. 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 Bye.